you know, some of the characters in the film is like the motorcycle club resonated with them. They got a sense of identity from it, the kind of camaraderie and community that is available within that space. Like I feel that with with my work, I, you know, I think we're, we are all kind of like forced to form very deep connections with people very quickly. And it's it's a it's kind of amazing what can what can happen and what can come up and it it really excites me. Listen, I wanted to ask you about this. So, so for people who don't know, let me just the, the, the film is inspired by a real motorcycle club turned gang from Chicago. Your character, mm-hmm. Kathy, who you just mentioned, modeled after a real woman named Kathy who's married to one of the members. She's one of the only women in the film. She's uh, very important in the film because she's the, the narrator of the film. And so this is Chicago. This is the Midwest. In, um, mm-hmm. And you're not from there. And yet I'm mm-hmm. here reading that this character reminded you of your nan. Uh, <laughs> what does that yeah. mean? How come? Um, there were qualities about her, which I recognized in my nan. One being that my nan was an incredible storyteller. Um, you know, she could recount something that happened and it might be the fifth time that she's told you it, but it would always somehow get even more interesting and exciting. And, uh, there was just a quality, quality about her, which made people lean in and, um, and listen, which I, I saw in Kathy and, I think she's credibly vivacious. There's a humor within her. There's an honesty. Um, so yeah, these were these were things that I um felt familiar to me with with women in my life, especially coming from Liverpool, you know. How do you mean? I just think there's a there's a quality that I think of with 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 um I guess generally northern people, but especially like thinking of uh, like in in regards to a, a woman, just northern women in the way in which they carry themselves and their humor and their warmth um, felt very much what who Kathy was. You had access to a lot about the real Kathy. You had um, yeah. a- access to photographs. You had access to, I believe, audio recordings, audio tapes of her speaking. Mm-hmm. I wonder if you could tell me the most like either the most surprising or the most interesting thing that you found when you were going through those tapes, when you're going through those archives? Hmm. I mean, I just, what I loved was it felt to me like Danny was the first person who'd ever asked her what she thought. You know, she'd gone through this decade of experience and all these things. And she'd obviously been kind of stifled or silenced or, kind of knew her place within that world. But then here was this guy asking her opinion and she had so much to say. It was fascinating having the audio because you were able to really hear, depending upon her kind of stresses or um, inflections or delivery, if she was kind of maybe lying or not, you know? Um, how, how she, like you, you could kind of tell in the way she said something? Yeah. Yeah, there was there was certain. I mean, listen, this is just my interpretation. Yeah, sure, 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 sure. I was yeah, yeah, yeah. kind of delving into yeah, that, yeah. but um, yeah, or you know, it might be saying that she doesn't really care about one thing, but you can you can hear in her voice that that's that's not the case. So that was amazing, you know, to to kind of pick apart those things and use as much as I as I wanted. But it was great because you could just hear the chaos around her as well, the the light in the cigarettes, pulling the cigarettes out the pack, shouting at the kids, telling the kids to get inside or, um, you know, her friends constantly coming through the door and, oh, like their fr- her friend, like making a comment and, you know, mid interview. And um, yeah, I, I spent a lot of time with them. So I, I was very, very fond of her. How was the, um, how was the accent? Like, I know you had, um, a, a dialect coach, and I, I read a little bit about mm-hmm. how you how you studied to get the Chicago sort of Midwestern accent, which is a strange one you don't actually hear in movies very often. Can you tell me a little yeah. bit about like how your what you, what your mouth has to do, like what what a little bit about what your do you know what I mean about how to like? Oh my God, I don't know. If, <laughs> I don't know if I could give you the the technicals. It was a very it was a long long time ago, and it was so tricky to get into. I mean, she had such a this like it was very she was quite nasally she made very interest interesting stresses on certain syllables and words and um 
and, and I think the biggest thing was that she was from Chicago, but when I started working with my dialect coach, Victoria Hanlon, she was like, she might be from Chicago, but every vowel sound is a complete contradiction. Like this is not a general Chicago accent. So she was like, do you want to do a general Chicago or do you want to try and emulate this audio? And I was like, well, I want to emulate the audio because that to me was gold, you know, and it's what drew me into her. It's what, um, what really kind of connected me to her. And it just felt like a shame not to explore that. So I just had to kind of make that decision very early on that I'm sure there'll be a lot of people who watch this movie who don't hear the audio and they think that's not a Chicago accent, you know, but it's, that wasn't necessarily what I was, um, what I was aiming for, but it was, it was huge. It felt huge, you know, especially cause she talks so much. So it was just about like, I think I started prep like two months before and it was just getting so familiar with it that, you know, that I could hopefully then get to set and it not be something that I was thinking about too much. And it just felt like second nature. Yeah. But you, you're pretty good with accents anyway. Like I know in, in, in Killing Eve, I saw you do a bunch of them, like uh, the Russian, German and Italian and French. And um, do they ever seep their way into your... Do they ever seep their way into your everyday language? Mm -hmm. So like I'm, I'm from Newfoundland and when I go to Ireland and I come back, I find it really hard. I find sometimes that accent has sort of bled its way in. Does that ever happen to you? Uh, I heard that in the hard then actually, when you said hard, I heard that. I find if I spend a lot of time away from Liverpool, my accent becomes a lot more diluted. Yeah. Um, and then like you, when I go home, it, it, you know, always inevitably becomes a little bit stronger, but I very much like to like, if I'm in a scene, I'll be present, I'll do the thing. And then once cuts called, I'm myself purely because I just don't think I'd be able to take myself seriously. Um, I'd kind of love to be bold enough to just do that and stay in a, stay in an accent, but I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't have it in me. I was struck by something you said when I was reading about it because um, about about your, your your Liverpool accent, your Liverpool mm -hmm. accent, because I sort of I think I know I think I know what it's like a little bit when I moved up here from from Newfoundland when I moved to Toronto. Um, mm -hmm. It's not like you get a hard time for it, <laughs> but it's just that people are a little maybe a little bit dismissive, or they sort of like they'll. I find that sometimes people correct my pronunciation of words that are just the way my accent says them. As, oh, interesting. And I've read a thing that you said about, uh, I've read a thing that like, you'll have to help me out with this, that at, at one point there was some sort of, someone was trying to get you or some people were trying to get you to sort of like tamp down your Liverpudlian accent a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I think, I think that was more something that I'd like, I don't know where I'd taken that on, but I would definitely remember being younger and like, I think I'd done like a couple of elocution lessons and I mean super young. And I remember like a very close friend of mine now, Stephen Graham, who's an incredible actor, who's also from Liverpool. I remember him being like, don't ever, don't ever change that. Like you don't need to do that in order to get roles on TV. And cause you know, I'd had experiences where I'd, a theater job I'd done when I was very, very young. I remember I got the role and it was to play a, a young girl who had R an RP accent. So received pronunciation. It's quite well-spoken English. And, yeah. um, and I did it, I did the job and I remember being halfway through and the director was very honest with me. And she said, I'm not, you know, I feel like I can tell you this now, but when I seen that you were from Liverpool and you were coming for this role, I thought, um, well, what, like, she's obviously not going to be right. You know, there's this kind of like, I guess, perception that I wouldn't be able to change it or, you know, those kinds of things. And it was very, it was a very beautiful moment for her to be very kind of frank with me, you know? Um, and actually I'm, I'm so proud of where I'm, where I'm from. Um, and it's been amazing to like, I, I did a, um, a film called Help for Channel 4 in the UK, which I was based in Liverpool. And then you know, I did a play called Prima Facie, which started on the West End and came to Broadway, where again, I was playing a woman from Liverpool. So I just love this idea that there's like a, you know, there's a scouser on Broadway playing a scouser, you know, it's it's to ha to represent the kind of city in that way is very, very cool. Yeah, I can relate. I can relate to you on that. I really can. Mm. You know, I, I hit it for a while and I'm, I'm happy. I, I'm happy. I don't. It strikes me that you're very proud of your accent. And that's lovely. Yeah. And it's funny because, you know, 
I go home and people are like, why are you speaking like that? You know, you, you sound different. And, yeah. um, I mean, I think that's just par for the course, but, um, when you're, when you're kind of not in that home city for a long time, but no, I'm very, very proud. Um, I, I was reading about you when you were coming up and I found this story really interesting. Um, so you were, you were part of a, like a high school theater group and mm -hmm. then, and then, um, your vacation plans, like your family vacation plans, didn't line up with the uh, rehearsals or, or for the for the or the for the talent show. Well, it was it was for the rehearsals. You're right. You're right. It was for the rehearsals for the school talent show. Yeah. And you did a monologue instead. Do you remember what that monologue was? Yes, it was a. I I don't remember the title, but it was. Um, it was a piece about the Hillsborough disaster, which was a football disaster that happened in England. Um, and I was like 12 at the time. Um, so it was quite a an emotional piece. Um, and I think that's, I was always very kind of connected to my emotions as a kid. I, it's kind of crazy looking back now because I remember when I did the talent show and I was kind of almost crying as I was introducing it. And I remember my drama teacher saying to me, like, what you have is amazing to be to for, for it to be that accessible to you. But you have to learn to control it, <laughs> um, you know, because I always just when I was doing that piece, the, the emotions would just come up and they'd be in my chest and it would be so present. And I hadn't quite figured out how to um, uh, to kind of handle that and use that in a, in a way that is helpful to me and in, in what I do. But that's always been kind of very readily um, available to me, um, which is kind of interesting, you know, to think I was like 12 years old and that's, that's I kind of had that emotional intelligence and connection at that age, um, which I, I am very um, appreciative of now. You know, I feel like I'm able to kind of garner so much from my work because um, I, I feel connected to it in that way. Oh, it's, it's like having a superpower. Like, it's like having like, it's like, you know, like in the X-Men when they have the super, I mean, I only saw the first one, but like in the X-Men when they're young, they have the superpower, but they don't really know how to control it. And it kind of, it. Yeah, they don't really know what to do with it. And like, you sort of felt this like, oh, I'm able to connect to this tragedy or I'm able to connect to this set. Because that's what led to the first professional acting gig, right? Yeah. So I did the, so I got, I was doing a, basically I was doing a dance from Chicago with my friends. I went on holiday. I wasn't there for rehearsals. They kicked me out. I was devastated. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then my mum was like, I'd basically won a local drama festival performing my monologue. So my mum was like, why don't you go in and perform your monologue? So I did. And then my drama teacher made me audition. Like, I, she didn't really know me. At the, like, I mean, I was like 12, but she was like, I, she was like, you can audition for the talent show. I'll see how good your monologue is. So I auditioned for her and she let me do the monologue. And then... I, I can't remember the time span, but it must have been like within a year later, there was a um, a request came through to lots of local schools in Liverpool. There was a local playwright um, called Lawrence Wilson, and the play was called The Tin Man. And they were looking for a young girl to play the lead in this radio play. And my drama teacher told me about it. And she sent me, she sent me and one other girl from our year and I went to an audition at the Everyman Theatre in Liverpool. And that was my first ever audition. And that was, and I got it. Come on. Um, and then, yeah. And then I spent like, must have been about four or five days in Manchester recording this radio play. My mum and dad chaperoned me. Um, and it was doing that radio play. Like I was working with a lot of actors who were on soaps at home, you know, I, who I watched like three times oh, cool. a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you know, with my family. It was a big, it was a huge deal um to me at the time and they were like you know they could just see how much I was enjoying it you know it just made me so happy and they were like you know if you really like this you know this could be a career you know you could get your headshots taken try and get an agent and an actress on that very kindly introduced me to her agent and a photographer and and yeah and then it kind of it all kind of went from there I, I I have limited time with you, so I need to skip ahead a little bit. Even though I'd love to, I'd love to ask what happened after that. Um, I wanted to talk about Killing Eve for a second because that's how mm -hmm. I, that's how I found out about you, and I think that's how a lot of people in Canada, especially, found out about you. Um, where you played um, 
uh, Villanelle. I, th- there's a great line from uh, Phoebe Waller-Bridge, who, who, who created the show, that um, when they were writing your character, they were always asking, what would you do if you weren't afraid? Mm. And I wanted to ask you as an actor, um, is there anything liberating about playing a character who's not afraid of anything? Totally. Totally. I mean, just even the the element of like not having to answer for anything. <laughs> um, you know, there's no kind of consequence. Um, saying exactly what you feel at any given moment and not not worrying about that or giving it a second thought. Um, I think I'm I'm really realizing that to play characters, we have to embrace whatever aspect there is of the character, you you are forced to embrace that aspect of yourself. And these might be feelings that you bury, or it might be something that actually you feel very um, connected with and it feels very present in your life, but you are forced to kind of conjure up and, and look at yourself, you look at yourself in in these diff- in all these kind of different lights. So, um, you can learn a lot, you know, in that in that way. I'm finding, like in your own life. Yeah, yeah. But it's like you know, if you're playing someone who's fearless and confident, and you know, walks into their room with their shoulders back, it's like you gotta you gotta find that within you. You've gotta, you know. At least I feel I, I I'm finding that like I'm I'm actually now I'm able to take away a lot from these experiences because I I can feel the kind of growth or subtle changes after playing certain characters. So the last thing I wanted to ask you about in the time we have is, I mean, just about, sort of about this moment you're having right now. You won an Emmy for Killing Eve. You won a Tony for Prima Facie, this amazing one-woman Broadway show that you did. You referenced that earlier. And it made me think a little bit about what might be motivating you. Motivation comes up in this film a lot. What motivates someone to join a motorcycle gang? What motivates someone to marry someone in a motorcycle gang? What motivates someone to step away from a motorcycle gang? What drives you? What what motivates you? I think I I'm so invigorated by what I do. I'm constantly discovering aspects of myself. I'm fascinated by about human emotion, human interaction. Um it just brings me so much joy, honestly. Like nothing is really like the like the characters in the, you know, some of the characters in the film is like the motorcycle club resonated with them. They got a sense of identity from it, the kind of camaraderie and community that is available within that space. Like I feel that with with my work, I, you know, I think we're we are all kind of like forced to form very deep connections with people very quickly. And it's it's a it's kind of amazing what can what can happen and what can come up and it it really excites me, um, so yeah. It's I just, I feel lucky that I get to do something that I genuinely love, um, and I've worked with amazing, you know, I've worked with some incredible people, and had I've had the opportunities that I have to really kind of stretch myself and and not be limited, you know, in in, in that way of push putting myself outside of a comfort zone. I like that feeling of being slightly terrified and not necessarily knowing how you're going to do something, but committing to the cause anyway and putting the work in and then actually at the end of it being like, I did that. You know, it's it's. I think it's the process as well, that process of, of fear to action to acceptance or being proud of something. Um, yeah. That's a beautiful thing. Thank you. Um, and I'm glad you kept your accent in, in all of it. I know. I know. Can you imagine? I'd be a fraud if I was sat here talking like this. I know. Like, who is this? I'd be a fraud if I was standing here talking like this to you. So that's <laughs> that's fine. Uh, love, lovely to meet you. Thanks for doing this. You too. Thank you so much. 